Hello and welcome back to Stimulus Steve. Today we're going to go through the software design and development HSC exam for 2021. So let's just jump right on in here. So to begin with, um, basically you'll see what I've done. Um, so what I'll, I'll always do is I grab that highlighter to start before I even do the exam. And what you'll see what I'm highlighting here is that the keywords or the things that I'm not quite sure about. Okay. Um, in the multiple choice section, if I can see the answer straight up, I will actually highlight it there. So that, for example, the development cycle there, defining and understanding was the answer there. Um, so yeah, basically I'm going through, um, when I saw that multiple list, I straight away thought checkbox. Um, then we had a data dictionary, so that was pretty obvious. And the idea here is just so that um, you're just using one tool and quickly um, getting your head around it. So create a common license, I wasn't quite sure on that one, so I didn't read through it all. Um, and yeah, basically the, the whole point of the highlighting section is if you have an idea, go for it, but you should only be using probably 60% of your brain. The focus is more on just trying to get those keywords highlighted and pseudocode, for example, like this part here, highlighting anything that's a variable just to make it really clear to yourself, like, um, like you're looking inside of an IDE. Um, so then this one here that we're looking at is the modular components. So the parameters that are going to be passed into the system and then working out what type of error that's occurred there. Uh, and then we've got system modeling, then a project meeting. So we're looking inside um, what happens inside a project meeting um, when you present it to team members. So I'm thinking structured walk through, um, but we'll come back to that one later. Array of records. So a member's been paid their fees. How's that um, DAR system going to look like? And then this one was a bit of a flow chart happening. So went through, highlight all the different variables, just to make sure that that was very clear. Um, and then any of the numbers um, output. So I'll, I'll know that I need to come back and then do a trace route on that guy, trying to work out exactly what happened there. This part here, pseudocode again, does look a little bit overwhelming when you first look at it. But my hint with this, if it's linked to the previous flow chart, a lot of the same structures will sort of should be leaping out at you here. So for example, there was a while loop. Um, there was a particular way of counting that was added on. So it's not going to be the repeat, which then gets rid of B and D. So you sometimes with these type of questions, you've got to play a bit of Sherlock Holmes and work out what it not what it isn't. And then that way it refines it. So in this one here, um, because it's got the, um, the count is equal to num, it's actually needs to be greater than the num. So I think it was A for that one. This one here was the range. Um, when we come back to that one, I think I actually tested out and put some data in. But again, at this stage here, I'm just looking at, so this is almost like the trailer of the movie. You're trying to work out what's gonna happen before you actually lean into this. And the more time you spend on this, the easier it's gonna make you a long run, in the long run. So it was an EBNF one. Um, we all remember the curly brackets and square brackets. So square bracket selection, S and S, and then curly brackets for the repetition. And then we're up to number 19. So code fragment for this guy, a um, bit of pseudo code. So again, going through highlighting those different variables. So just so that it stands out to me when I'm coming back and reading through it. It also helps when you're um, trying to do a bit of desk checking or working through these problems. Uh, I think this was a, yep, so this was a sorting. So you got your three different types of sorting. So you got your selection sort, insertion sort, and bubble sort. So bubble sort's the easiest one where it just massages up and the little bubble comes up each time like a, um, in a can of Coke. Insertion is where it comes through like a wall and then each element gets um, ordered afterwards once it gets to that point. And the selection is where it goes through like an insertion, but instead it, um, goes through the whole array, unsorted array and finds the values. This one here, two different techniques to use to prevent software piracy. Um, these questions here, because it's out of three, make sure that you give at least three marks worth of um, content when you're responding to this. Uh, large company, I didn't quite read that one. So th this one, and then you'll see that I'm highlighting the two. So then that just sort of stands out in my brain that I've got to make sure that I've got to do two things. The case tools. Uh, this was a data flow diagram with two um, data files. So you have the events and the athletes. And then you have the administrator needing the information updated um, to give the performances. Um, athletes can search for the particular events that they're going to work on. 
and it also updates the current record. So um, the trick with these type of questions is you go through, you do the actors that are involved into it. So you've got the administrators that come into it and the athletes and then the databases and then working out the processes that are attached. This one here, um, two ways the logbook uh, may be used. So um, if, if you've done your assignments, that should be a pretty easy question to answer. Uh, mobile phone, um, being app for changing the um, translation. So straight away, it's it's a bit more of a newer tech type of technology. So one of the social ethical issues associated with this app, um, outline any of the uh, methods or installations for this app, and then justify the appropriate software development approach. Straight away, I'm, I'm thinking agile because it's new technology. Um, nine times out of 10, you'll find that'll be agile as the answer. Uh, describe one compatibility issue and performance issue. So we'll come back to that later. Uh, this one's a little bit trickier. So this, I think, was a pseudocode algorithm. Yep, so it was guessing my number. So there was a random number function that was generated for you. So you just need to be able to quote that. You don't need to rewrite the random number. And for this one, straight away, when I'm looking at it, I'm thinking it's a nested if statement. So if you get the guess, this is the correct answer. And then if it's too high or too low, then that branches out there. We've got a system flow chart here. Uh, so we're looking at a database for a car company. So we've got the da database of the customers and the database of the cars. And then we're looking at how that data will flow back and forward between them. So describing the data that's used in the files and how we will use this system. So we've got the input from the username. We just basically got to describe those parts that are there. This one's a little bit trickier. So it's a binary search, which we've covered uh, with seven elements. Um, and then we went found. So I've gone through and highlighting all the different variables, trying to work it out. Does an integer division, so it finds the index. So binary search, if you remember, that's the one where if we have to guess a number between one and a million, we can do it within 20 guesses. So you ask if it's below, above or below 500,000 and see how we get rid of 500,000 elements. And then it comes down a little bit further each time. So this is a list of all the different things that are in there. So there's gonna be a straight desk checking uh, the logic um, in lines 12 and 14. And this is the benefit of reading through the whole thing first. So when you come back, you've seen what the questions are gonna be asking because they're usually, these type of questions, there's, there's up to two to four different layers that line into it. Uh, this one here, we're doing a search algorithm. So we're gonna search through it until we find um, a particular thing within inside the string. And this is all about a Boolean flag. So this is a variable that um, exits loops. So it, it forces the um, loop to boot out before it ends. Uh, this one here is a subroutine, so it's checking to see if it is a match inside a bigger string. So this is a, um, a substring match um, problem. So you're gonna go through and you're gonna work out whether or not that string is inside the, the larger string, which is pretty cool. Uh, EBNF diagram, so a little Diagram here where you're looking, so select is the same and everything, case has been the same, and it seems it's got a statement and then a condition um, that you need to be able to work through. So the conditions and statements are already predefined, so you don't need to rewrite those. You just need to write them inside of the um, less than greater than symbols because they're non terminating because you don't know exactly what those values might be. Um, fetch execute cycle, so fe <laughs> fetch deadly eel safely, we all remember that. So you go through that one, you have a look, uh, you're looking at the register, um, straight away analyzing inside of that. So what, what do you fetch? So it's gonna be a subtraction um, routine. Uh, what gets decoded inside the CU? What gets um, executed in ALU? And then we go from there. Uh, this one was an employee overtime problem. So there's a file called employees and then there's a separate file called um, employee, um, uh, over time. So then basically you're going to go through and look at each part. So there's an employee ID that um, stores the employee's names, but then there's a separate thing that um, actually stores what the timesheet was almost. And we'll come back through that later. Uh, that's there. You've got some extra writing if you ever need it. Super useful if you um, get read through your code and realize that it's not quite right. You can always add more stuff into that. And that's my favorite thing with these type of exams. Make sure you never stop writing. You've got three hours. Please, please, please make sure you, you should be always writing something unless you can guarantee that 100% that we're all chasing. 
Okay, um, so we did the hardware and software option instead of the um, object orientated. So I'm just fine because I come from a math background that's a little bit easier. So hexadecimal, we remember they're doing in groups of four and changing those numbers um, into the letter um, version. Two's complement, so you've got 32 times five, which we'll come back and work through that. Uh, Boolean expression. So we'll just use a bit of Boolean logic. So I think C, not C was um, present in both of those. So you could take not C out the front. And then um, that was a little bit trickier the first time around, but we, we worked out a pretty cool little solution there. Uh, any two bits. So this is this looks like you're gonna be doing uh, 11 plus one, which is the same as three plus one, which would be four. So that output down the bottom there should be one zero zero, which we'll come back to later. Um, and see what the error is and how we could potentially solve it. Uh, this one here, so outline the different data, um, typical data structures. So that's the um, header, data block, and the trailer. Then you've got a little um, bit of code there that goes through working out how to do a 3D printer and looking at the data stream. Um, if you look down the bottom of that, it has either open or closed. So you can either um, have the, the jet of um, plastic coming out or not. And then it's seven bits for each of the X and Y coordinates. So because it's seven bits, it only gives you um, one twenty up to 127, which was um, pretty cool. Uh, and then there was the five instructions. So you literally had to apply to each one of those. My hint was to break up the data block up and then work out what the X value was, what was the Y value, and if it was open or close, and then draw the shape. And then at the end, he had to do a 3D version of the data block. So this was making um, three walls on side of a box, and there were 16 high each time. So pretty much um, you had to get the, the, the loop happening for it to follow along the bottom, and then work out what the, was the repetition set that had happened inside of that. Um, so it's just writing basically a bit of code, but um, it was using zeros and ones instead of um, the normal sort of programming languages that we're happier with. Um, but it was kind of cool because you just had to look at the reference table. And then my hint with those type of questions when we get there is you write out more of a um, pseudocode version of it and then translate it into the zeros and ones, which might make it a bit easier for you guys when we get there. So to start, software development cycle, um, already worked that out. That was in the defining stage when you work out the needs. A company serving um, five different sources of um, and the options, that was definitely a checkbox because you would want those different, they can select multiple. That was just a data dictionary. We should have picked up on that straight away. So a Creative Commons license, this is a little bit harder. So um, when we think about Creative Commons, there is a license agreement attached to it. So the ownership of the property is still there. So, um, you can potentially own it. The limited version is more of a shareware option. It defines the maximum legal number of simultaneous users. That's more of sort of an Adobe account, so it's not quite Creative Commons. Um, and I'm pretty sure it was B or D. No, it makes, no, so no intellectual properties is not Creative Commons because you do have the rights to your property. Which of the following um, essential features of event-driven software? So stuff like Java, you always have some sort of option that you click on it and then something um, something gets responded to the input that you've done in type inside the system. So it's not always coded in low level languages. You can, there, is, there are some out there, but we're not gonna be doing that. Um, the program determines the order of execution. N not so much, it's not really, um, that's more um, sequential programming, iterative programming. So D was the answer there. So inputs, um, are what's used. What is the purpose of the Sentinel value in a sequential file? It's basically the end of the file. So I had to just go through. Yep, so A marks the end of the file. In a program of sequence of statements um, be executed the least once, uh, which control structure? I initially started thinking binary selection, but then I started thinking, oh, well, an if statement, if it was just an exclusive if, absolutely. That, um, but it doesn't necessarily, it would work only if there was an if and then an else part. If it was just the if part, it would not be a binary selection. So that's why the post test um, was um, one, the option that needed to, that sort of stood out there. 
considering the following coding fragment. So you're looking at this, when, um, when is the parameter passed into this program? So if you go down to calculate a cost, that's where the, um, the change is inserted into that function and gets activated into a sub module. So because it's been passed into that and passed down, only line number six is the one that is um, the one that's important there. So that was A. In a complex modular system, module A calls module B during the testing process. An error message um, was produced indicating that module A had provided far too many um, parameters for the module B to proceed. What type of error has occurred? So module A is calling module B. So it's trying to work out um, using the, this uh, application in a lower level. So this module has been called. An error message has then been produced. So it's indicating that module A had too far parameters. So that means the module B um, needed a few more things in it, otherwise it wasn't gonna be activated. So it's known as syntax error because both those uh, modules are fine because they were both compiled. It's actually a runtime error. So overflow is um, if the numbers were too, too much and data type error mismatches if it was using integers compared to strings. So that's why it's a runtime error. Um, system modeling, developer understands the cause of the error. So that would just be a structure chart. So it's not going to be a context diagram. It's not going to be a storyboard and um, it's not going to be a system flow chart. So that would be just a straight structure chart. Number 11, in the project meeting, um, members present their code for review and identify errors. What's been done, that was the structured walkthrough. So you're, you're presenting your code to other people. You're not get going through and actually doing a desk check or any of the other options. Uh, number 12, in an um, array of records, members and fees. Um, members have not paid their fees. Which row of the table correctly shows the data type for X and the data structure for fees paid? So if you look at the members, it's got a value that's coming in um, that would be an integer because that's probably going to be the ID of the, um, the member. So it's going to be B or C. And then because it's it's just one rec, um, one part of the record, because you're only looking at the fees paid, it's not the whole record with their, num their name, their number, their phone number, and all those type of things. It's just the field, right? So if we remember with our databases that we've done before, fields are those value, the, the top of the columns, all those different options that you want to choose through. So 12 there was um, B. This one took me a bit longer though, just to read through and trying to get my head around it. So it definitely had to be an integer because that was a number when it came through. And then it was a field instead of a record. So records are when you have multiple different attributes of a record inside a record, whereas a field is the different parts. Now this one here, um, I'd like just moving through it. So. If you see um, my brain thinking through it, I just follow along and see what happens. Um, it's pretty much doing even numbers because if it's even, it, it, it prints it. If it's odd, it doesn't. So that's going to be just a simple mod um, calculation using mod two on the um, number. So if it's even, it will go. And then we'll check again. Um, and then because it's, gr it, it's either going to be the B or C, but it's actually going to get up to eight and then it's going to go again because it's not greater than eight yet. If it was greater than equal, it would have been B, but because it said just, said just greater than, it's that's why it was C for this one here. So um, like I said, just follow along with the code. Um, having it highlighted helped a heap here as well, trying to get my head around where um, the numbers were coming through. And yeah, the thing that I was pausing on there was trying to work out what happens when it gets to the um, the C value? And so I was trying to think, well, what what happens here? Is it going to be, is the eight included or not included? But then um, coming back to it, just focusing on that less than or greater than symbol, um, it didn't include the equals. So that means that the eight needed to ha have occurred. So. Yeah, and, and what you'll find, it doesn't hurt just to write down some of your ideas as you go. So this one here was linked um, to the previous one, uh, which I realize later. So um, looking at that structure, I see at the bottom is count greater than um, the number. That helped, gave my head around it. And then because it's a pre-test, it's not a post-test, straight away it's not B or D. 
And then what I was looking for inside these two um, was some sort of similar structure. So I found what was different, which was at the end there. So um, it was either gonna be that one or that one. And then because of, it was either of those, I went with A. Now this one here, the range, um, what I did was I made it the smallest number possible. So you would have the 20 would be the smallest number from the start. And then if you're taking away, you actually want to be the biggest number. So you would do 20 take away the 10, which would leave you down to 10. And then if you want to do the biggest number possible, it would be the 30. And then you would only take away the five instead of the 10. So you would be um, left with 25. So that's how I got the 10 um, and then the uh, 25. But like I said, if you get stuck, doesn't hurt just to write out a little bit of math, just trying to work through the problem and see where the, what, what actually happens with the, the values. My hint here is the more that you write as you're going through it, it just helps your brain process it rather than trying to sit there and try and do it all and juggle up, up the top. Um, and you should pick up my handwriting is not necessarily the best, um, but I still do that process just to make my life a bit easier. So this one was an EB and F diagram. So you definitely have a Y at the start. So you're definitely gonna have at least one Y. Um, and then I think it was an X, which was optional because uh, of the square brackets. And then you had um, an X or a Y or an X afterwards with multiple zero or multiple. So it's definitely zero. Oh, sorry, it's just zero or one. And then the, um, the Y was the one that um, was unlimited. So because you had Y at the front, you definitely have to have one. Um, because there's X, you potentially have none. Or at the bare minimum, you, at the maximum, you can have two of them. Considering this code fragment, so you got X equal to five, Y equal to five. So while X is less than 10, X is equal to Y, repeat, add um, one to Y until Y is greater or equal to 10 end the while and then print out the X and the Y. So straight away, X is equal to five and Y is equal to five. And then you repeat through. So you add one on until Y is greater than 10, greater or equal to 10. So Y is gonna equal to 10 and then it's gonna stop. Then it's gonna go back up to the top while X is greater than um, 10. So X is um, now equal to Y. So then that makes it equal to 10. So then that loop, um, the third line trigger is going to be um, not, not going to be able to go go again. So this is the last time through and then repeat. So then it's because it's a post test, it's going to add one onto that Y straight away. So then the X is going to be equal to 10 and then the Y is going to be equal to 11, um, which then makes the, the loop exit out and then you're done. So I think 17 was B from memory. So that should give you the 10 and then the 11 for as we just described. Awesome. Okay, 18 lexical analysis. This is all about tokenization. So straight away it's lexical here tokens. So it's either gonna be B and D. That's what I thought of my brain. So converts the sequence of characters into the sequence of tokens compared to the one at the bottom, determine the correct order of the tokens, which is not what lexical analysis does. It just takes the sentence that was given to it. So then um, that's what be, why it was being. Question 19, consider the following code fragment. So num is equal to the number of elements in the list, x is equal to one, y is equal to num, and then repeat. So then list at the position x now equals what y is. So because x was one, it's gonna be equal to eight. So one's going to swap over to eight and then Y actually just going to stay the same because it's, it's going to reference itself. And then X is equal to one and then Y is equal to net minus one. So it's basically pushing in the X across one and then the Y coming down one, which then makes um, that basically it looks like a mirror version of whatever's at the back end of this. So drawing a little table um, helps a heap with this just to get my head around it. Um, you're more than welcome to do it another way if you need it. So what I've worked out was one is equal to five. So six came out the front there, six then went up to the back and then you moved into the next part. 
So then um, it's gone down to this um, x is equal to 2 and then y is equal to 4. So then x now equals the 8 at the end and then 5 in the middle and then we're good to go. So then that's the answer, which I think was C. Yeah. So that was what C was equal to. And then as soon as X is greater than the number, then um, you exit. So it's just pretty much going to mirror itself as, even though it gets past that thir third one because it's already got the symmetry happening. You don't really need to go much further. So this is an unsorted array. Again, you've got your bubble sort, which is the basic. Then you've got your selection, then insertion. So bubble sort means that the element keeps moving forward. So it keeps doing a swap with it. And if no swaps occur, then it's it's sorted. Whereas an insertion, uh, selection sort goes through and finds the, the highest value or the lowest value that it's looking for and then moves it to the into position. So you'll have this unordered sort on the um, one side and then the ordered sort on the other. Whereas an insertion sort is very similar, but instead what it does is it, it just takes the, it's like a wall as it's going through and it basically pushes the value down as it goes. So with this one, what I was looking for, um, the two obviously got pushed down. So the four bubble sorted up, so it floated. And then so did that seven, if you look at it. So straight away, because I saw that two and the seven floating up, it was a bubble sort coming from, from the left. Right, model choice done. So now we moved into the um, software piracy issues. So these were the two different techniques. Um, I went straight away back to, and thought about th um, examples that I've had in my life. So Adobe Creative Cloud, how do they protect um, their software? So what they have is named user um, licensing. So basically you'll have to have an email address or some sort of unique ID attached to your name. And that links to an email address or an account. So if you, um, for example, for Adobe, if you log into it, the software automatically um, detects. So it goes online, sees whether or not you're a valid customer. So you've paid your subscription fee or you've got an account with them. Um, and if you've got it, then all good, you're allowed to use the software. So the software is already downloaded and used on your computer, but the license um, is sort of the key to the engine to turn it all on. If you don't have that authorization straight away, um, the software will not load up for you, um, which is what it's meant to do. So um, Adobe used to be one of the most heavily pirated software uh, back in the day, because uh, basically people would um, just get the serial keys off friends or whatnot and then they were able to log in. So now with these new online systems, that stops that from happening. The other way that you can do it is um, what I was briefly touching about there is serial numbers. So um, back in the day when you bought your original game, so StarCraft was one of the first games I ever bought, um, you had to type in manually a 32 uh, character serial key. Um, and then that was a mixture of numbers and letters. And if your particular key was registered, uh, no one else could use that. So straight away, your key would be registered online and then no one else could actually activate that if you wanted to play online um, against other people. If you didn't want to play against other people, you could actually just share that key around, but only one person could have that key. So if you shared that key around and you want to play um, against each other on Battle.net, which was the online system at that time, you could only play uh, with one key active. So that was the incentive to go out and make sure that you've um, done the right thing and haven't um, copied or pirated those um, software. So like I said, a serial number was a unique key with digits and characters that was manually typed in. Um, and yeah, the original StarCraft basically was the example I had off the top of my head. Um, and then that, that protects not just the, the end company, because obviously we want people to build these games. So in, in order for them to build, they need to, they've got f f families at home to pay. So feed and they need to be paid for it. So that, that's one of the reasons why um, serial keys are super useful. So, and then I just wrote just a little dodgy example of what a serial key could look like. So a large company then is developing an automatically generate autom um, appropriate responses to customer queries. So this system um, wants us to go through and explain why live testing is super useful here. So um, the idea is you've built this awesome system. You don't just want to walk away in the sunset and it not work. So years ago, I built an app to teach English in Japan. Um, using AWS, you could actually build a system that would, um, as the load increased, it would actually build multiple computer servers so that it could handle it. And then if those servers weren't needed, it would actually kill them off. 
So you would only have the resources that you need at the time. And if anyone that's worked with AWS, you know how um, expensive it can get. So that was quite useful in saving money. So um, in terms of this one here, the live testing basically wants to stress the software and see if, it, um, if the data can be handled. So if a lot of data is being used, if the processes and the transactions um, have occurred within this side of this database, you wanna check for the val validity and verification of the data so that it's coming through and it's, it is what it um, actually is meant to be. So the, there's, there's a lot of importance there that you make, you gotta make sure that it, um, that's occurred. Um, you, you basically, um, there's a certain role which we call a pressman and their, their job is to try and break the system with as much um, trying to work out what could go wrong. You might even try SQL injections to see if, if the data breaks. So you want to try um, with normal queries, but also regular queries to see if um, they've been considered just so that the, the person um, that owns this software that you've built for them, so the company, um, doesn't have a, uh, a bit of a lemon on their hands that's not going to work. So yeah, you're basically trying to break the system with both normal and um, irregular types of data and seeing what could go wrong. Um, and if it handles these requests appropriately, then it's all good. The other thing that you want to actually try and do is give the simulation is if, if this software has been built for 30,000 people to log in, uh, like Netflix or something like that, or if it's um, needed to be placed strategically around the world. So for example, Netflix, when, when you log in there, uh, you're logging into the Australian server. You're not necessarily logging into the American server. Um, and then that's, that's just basically for um, making sure you don't have lag, the size of the data that's transferring across the continents and all that type of stuff gets limited there. So you're trying to see if the performance of this software is gonna match um, what you've detailed. Um, and then by, by simulating with the use of multiple users and data coming into it, you can see any of the performance issues that might, might pop up. Um, so again, with that app that I built in Japan, uh, we actually had a testing server in Japan and one in Australia. So we would test in um, Australia and then try again in Japan. And the, you could see the significant difference between loading it. So just loading the application in Australia would take, I think it was uh, 15 seconds. Whereas if we did the Japanese version, it actually would take probably about 42 seconds, just because it had to transfer all that distance across um, to Australia. So there, there are really valid reasons of making sure that you've tested the product and not just um, with the software, but where is the hardware located does sometimes have a pretty significant impact on your clientele. Outline two responsibilities of software developers in relation to the development of this software. So again, um, you see that I've highlighted it. There's two, and then it's also this, this, this question is all linked to around an athletics carnival. So make sure you reference the athletics carnival. Again, that's something that I missed when I was highlighting, but you can see that I just quickly um, underline it there. So when I think about athletics carnivals, uh, two things come to mind is the data. So athletes are gonna be obviously competing. You wanna make sure you get that data and the events um, straight away. Some athletics carnivals even have those um, proper Olympic um, lasers at the end of the runs now so that you can actually detect when the run happens and then there's a level of automation that occurs in that. Um, so you could even actually mention that now that I'm thinking about. Um, you also wanna make sure that the data is stored securely and that there's um, validated. So validation means that you're checking to see if the data has been um, consistently coming through and that there are no errors that have happened inside of the data as it's been transferred across. So if the kids um, gotten one minute 30 for their run, they don't, all of a sudden don't wanna be stored as um, you know 90 seconds, um, might all of a sudden be stored as nine seconds for some unknown reason, right? So you need to validate the data and the, there are simple ways of checking that. So you can actually put rules into some um, systems like this. So for runs in particular, if the run was exceptionally fast, like under you know the world record of the current 100 meter runner, you probably would have be a little bit concerned there. So you need to make sure uh, that it's gonna match. And then you, you should see, also see that I've numbered it. So I've got one, here's my one of the responsibilities. And then the second one that I've said there uh, is you need to do a needs analysis of the carnival. So before you even build any programming, making sure making sure that the developer's gone over and looked at what does the, the what does the carnival actually need, 
um, so that it can survive. So that's when you look at the must-haves, the should-haves, and the could-haves. Um, so the must-haves are the things that have to happen. So the hardware that's put in place uh, for reading and documenting. The should-haves are the ones that are oh, that should that might be useful, but we don't. It's not uh, mission critical. And the could-haves are the big dreams that could make it awesome. Next one, so describe two ways that case tools can be used to help in the development of this. Um, so case tools are the, the tools that help automate the software engineering process. So IDEs um, like Visual Studio Code or um, PyCharm or those different sorts of softwares that we've looked at, they allow you to do, um, because there's a large team that's involved in it, they allow you to work on the same bit of code at the same time. Um, so it's kind of like using Google Docs where you can collaborate together and then work through and build the code um, a lot more efficiently. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at um, Visual Studio Code. Um, you also can log in on the cloud. So you don't necessarily need to have one person, one person's computer where they've saved it lo locally on their drive. You actually want that code to be up on the cloud or some sort of remote server. So then everyone can see the same code. Uh, and then at the same time, you might also have version control. So you might be able to see as any um, new updates or uh, bits of code that have been modified, you can then see what's happened exactly at the same time. So the key word there is a synchronicity, which is basically allowing you to work at the same time on the code and see exactly what, um, you might have a lead programmer that's really driving it and then they might have found some revolutionary way of doing one particular part of the code. It also allows you to see the history of the code at the same time by using a good ID like this. So you can see any of the changes that have occurred. So if a mission critical thing goes wrong, you can always revert back to a previous version and use that instead of the faulty version. The other thing that um, the case tool that you might wanna do is you wanna do stress testing. So you might be um, loading it with a whole heap of data so you want to see whether or not the code will break. And what's happening there is you're literally jamming it with very similar to what the previous version uh, question was talking about, where you're using live data to simulate what the, the potential users of the Athletics Carnival might do on the day. So um, Athletics Carnival is for any teachers that have been involved in it, it can get quite stressful. Um, there's a lot of stakes because the kids have been training for so long for those events. And you want to make sure that you're getting it right. So. Um, a good piece of software will go through and then check to see that the, the transactions or the system can handle it with, um, like we're talking about, that, that validation pro and verification processes that occur inside of databases and making sure that the data hasn't been corrupted or um, overridden for the wrong way or um, particularly event, um, when events have been broken. So if there's new records for schools, the, there's a whole heap of other troubles that sort of come into play with that. Um, which you want to make, be mindful of. So you basically want to check to see if all the potential inputs um, don't crash the system and then the data used within it is all nice and validated. Cool, data flow diagram. So this one here was a little bit trickier. So what we're looking at is two different files. So we've got the events file and then the athletes file. So, and then from memory, there was two different actors. So there's administrators and then there was athletes as well. So administrators are the people that set up the program and then athletes are the ones that go for particular events. So what I try and do when I look at questions like this is try and imagine real world, what would happen? So most of us have um, at least seen an athletics carnival. Um, we can imagine what would be the processes that have occurred behind the scenes. So on the left, usually what I try and do is write any of the actors. And then on the right, what I do when I'm writing these out is I try to write any of the databases or the data stores that we're using. So in this case here, the administrator would be dealing more with the athlete side. So they would be setting up all the athletes data. If we read through that, so they can enter and update information for the athletes and enter their performance. So then their performance would then go into a separate data field, which is the events. So any of the actors or the administrator or the athlete, for example, they're represented by boxes. So by having a nice box like that, you put in the data uh, the name of the, the, the actor that goes inside of that. Any of the files or the databases or the data stores that you're working with, that's the same as a box, but it's open. So it's, imagine like an open box that you can put information in and also take information out of it, which is what the athletes or the events phase is. 
The processes then are what it says. So um, they can enter a new athlete or they can update the information on the athlete or they can enter in the performances. So if you notice really carefully what I'm doing here is I'm just drawing um, the main pieces and then the processes. I haven't drawn any of the arrows yet because I'm still trying to work out who the administrator, who the actors are and who the databases are. So then the third one there would be the enter in the performances. And you see by highlighting in this at the start makes this a little bit easier because you can see very clearly I need to enter the, their performances. So athletes are the last bit, so that, that's going to be another actor. So that's going to need to have a box on the side there. And the, the athlete is going to um, be able to search for a particular event and see how they've performed in that event. Okay, now there is a bit of assumptions here when you're filling it in. Um, so we're going to put the athletes there and you can use a little bit of your discretion to try and work out if it is appropriate or not appropriate to fill in with the relevant data. So you got your athlete there, you've got your events, and then um, we need to be able to access that. So there needs to be some way of updating the record. Um, sorry, to search. So we want to be able to search for the particular events and see who currently has the record of the event. That's what this um, little section in here is going to be doing. Okay, so I'm looking through this, trying to think through. I'm updating all the current record breakers um, when a record is broken, designing the data flow diagram that models proposed solution. So again, data flow diagram, we need to put one more circle there and then that's going to be the searching. So if you notice really carefully here, I've actually put all the pieces of the puzzle in place first, and now I go through and link it. So instead of trying to link it at the beginning, um, I find I get confused with that. So I try this helps me trying try to process my brain when I'm going through it. So administrators want to come through and enter the new data. So they're going to pass in all the details of, of the athlete when they're typing in that. So it might be their name, their ID, um, what school they're representing, uh, what's the address and all those different types of things get passed in that so that's when the new athlete comes in and then that that goes into the function so if you see if you think about this carefully it's it's sort of starting the beginning of what your program would need so there would need to be a function that does new athlete okay and then the arrow coming into it helps you try to work out what would be the information that needs to be stored and then where does that go in so into the database, it would then insert all the data that um, had been transferred across um, from that little bit there. The next bit then would be the update function. So updating, um, you're not necessarily passing all the information, you're just needing really the athlete's ID if you've done any database work. So by passing that athlete ID across, you're then gonna um, pass across any of the information that goes along with that that you do want to update. So you might want to update, for example, the name, but just the name, not everything else. And then that information needs to go into the database. Cool. Um, and then there might be some validation processes and all that type of stuff that happens behind the scenes. But in terms of this, you're just literally updating those details and following the process. So this actor, the administrator, this is the process that they can do. And then this is the information that flows from that um, into a, the data store, okay? Which is why it's called a data flow diagram, funny enough. Uh, the next one uh, was entering their performances. So this would actually go into two places. So their performance would be stored inside the athletes or some sort of link to it if you're using a relational database. And then you would have it stored in the events, what actually happened. So if they won shot put, how many meters did they win by? Or what were their three, throw, their three throws? Um, if they run a, a 100 meter race, what was the time? That information needs to be stored somewhere. Now, a good database manager would probably put it just in the events because you don't want to have redundancies by putting it into the athletes and into the events. But then if there is a record um, of the, the athlete performing and it needs to be linked to their particular name, it would be useful to store it in the athlete's database as well. So inside that, you would link the um, athlete's details to the event 
And then if there was an event that had occurred, if there's a record, for example, that's been broken, you need that information to be stored into the events file, which is what happens along that line. So the athlete performs, they may break the record, they may not, but it doesn't matter because that information needs to be passed across. So the athlete's performance needs to then be stored into the events, which then allows um, that information to be stored in one spot and not in multiple spots. So the athlete can access that event database and then um, make a decision of what needs to happen. So if you look carefully here, um, I don't go straight to the arrows exactly for this reason because it helps me write the story of what happens between the, each link. And by having all the pieces of the puzzle lined up like that with the actors, the processes and the data stores, it does make it significantly easy to work out what goes where. So then this one here was a search algorithm. So he's gonna go through um, searching a particular event and then the event um, gets passed across. So this one don't really need to rewrite. It's just gonna be searching event again. And then the results that come back from the event um, database then comes back to the athlete. So then they can see how they performed. So athlete to search particular event to see the details of the current record. So the event record then comes back to that person. Cool. Outline two ways that a logbook could be used to assist with the development of a software solution. So again, I've highlighted the two of them. So there has to be two different things. We're focusing on logbook, which is what we all did with our assignments. So you should be fine with this. And um, the two that stand out with me um, straight away off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly what I wrote, but it would be um, your ability if anything went wrong, you could then literally just reuse the code. And then also if, if you left the program um, project while you're working on it, someone can then pick up and see what your thought patterns were up to that point. So logbooks are super important, particularly for industry levels. So um, I've written here, if a catastrophic event happened and you lost all your work, everything got deleted, but you still had your logbook showing step-by-step step what happened, that is significantly better than having to retype the code from scratch and trying to remember what you did where and what was your decision processes along the way. So if the all your code got deleted, that was one definite solution using a logbook. So it helps you rebuild the code from the scratch. The second one um, I think I did was if um, you leave the pro development of the Athletics Carnival program or whatever um, project that you're working on, um, it's, it's pretty bad form just to walk away and hope that they can read through the code and see maybe a few comments here and there and understand what's going on. So to fix that, what happens is most people will leave a very clear um, step-by-step logbook of what the decisions were at any of the key junctions. Um, also any of the versions that have occurred along the way. Uh, I know programmers don't usually like this, but documentation is um, probably one of the most important things inside of um, a software company. Because if you don't have it documented, it's very hard to try and work through the code because um, you didn't build it. But in saying that though, if you've got very clean code, um, that does help as well. So um, having a logbook allows you to see the decisions made in the past and understand why exactly that code was done. Okay, so this is super useful um, if you've left the, the programming company, for example, or an error's popped up and you've already handled that error in the past and then you'll go back to through your logbook and go, oh, actually, that's how we solved it with that particular system. Cool, so this one was a mobile phone app has been developed to allow two people speaking different languages to have a conversation. The app translates the speaker's language into the other person's language. What is, I think it was some of the ethical issues. Yeah, so the language of the listener. So um, describe one of the social or ethical issues associated with this app. Straight away, I'm thinking accessibility. So um, different cultures, even though you've translated into the right language, it may um, be offensive the way that you say it. So um, for example, in Chinese, uh, when you say ma, there's actual five different tonalities that are attached to it, uh, which can mean different things. So if you go um, ma, ma, it, it, it can, I can't remember exactly what it was, but one means um, mother, one means horse. So if you, you've got to be very careful um, how that you use that. Uh, 
and then hopefully the app can pick up on that tonality thing issue. Also the dialogue um, with the language needs to be considered of the cultural ramifications. So there might be different regions inside of a particular country that does do use the same language, but the, they have different accents or um, different interpretations of um, nouns. And then also the sen sentence structure may not necessarily be correct. So you might have translated um, verbatim what's been said, but then the actual meaning has been lost in the way that it's been translated. So that would be a bit of an accessibility issues with the mobile phone app. Uh, outline an appropriate method what was it of of initialization installing of this app so this was the direct cutover so there's four different ways of installing there's parallel phased piloting and then direct cutover so piloting is when you're trialing it um, while the other application is still running phasing is where you're phasing it out so it's like a funnel you're slowly taking out different modules and putting um, using them in the, the new modules in the new system and then parallel is when you run both at the same time and then there's this overlap phase where they're both using the same time and then you just get rid of it. Um, all of them are useful. They have different times when they are um, very viable. But in this case here, this is just going to be a direct cutover. So the app's going to be built. Um, as soon as the person purchased the application off the store or wherever it is, they just get a copy. So this is the direct cutover. Um, installation process which we've covered before and then as soon as they buy it they get it what would be the appropriate method so like I've talked about previously over and over before um, nine times out of ten when you see a software development approach agile is the one uh, waterfall is probably more useful if it's something where you know um, how to do the exact process and all the unknowns and unknown uh, so if it's very cookie cutter like if you're building a payroll program for example uh, even rapid application development or um, structured processes would be the better one. But in this case here, Agile is the one to use because it's it's new technology. So you don't know exactly how this thing's gonna work um, because obviously the new framework might have came out or it might be some sort of machine learning algorithm that's going on behind the scenes with the new um, a new database link or something else might be at play here where you need a level of flexibility. The other thing that's useful here is you can talk to the client as you're building it and then getting their feedback as it's been tested to see whether or not your, your line of thought is working. Uh, and because it's it, it's so diverse, like there's, there's hundreds and thousands of different languages on the planet. Uh, um, when you're converting, um, I think I did the example of changing it from English to Japanese and just focusing on one particular con um, language first, so language translation with that. So you don't, you can see whether or not the, the framework works first rather than getting confused about what happens um, if it's if it's um, you know English to French then English to Spanish it might be a noun issue it might be a word issue it might be the sentence structure it might be the way that the person spoke they, there's a whole heap of different factors whereas if you just focus on one and get that right you can work out all the issues and the bugs in one go um, and then that way it's all created for you so there's a brand new um, technology when you're creating it. It's never, it, I, there are some um, technology out, I have seen this being done before, but again, there might be a new AI framework that's been popped out that allows it to be done. So to getting it to market as soon as possible is really important as well. So you, you don't wanna have to build it with a structured approach and then in three years time, you'll have a final product, but then you've had a competitor that's already released it, tested it and um, deployed it. So by having a, an agile approach, you're gonna get it out to market as, as quick as possible. Um, and then you might wanna then focus on just one language. So instead of having multiple languages, just focusing on the one, just so that you can see any of the issues that or perceived issues that might pop up. And then you're not gonna get as confused in the long run with what happens with it. And then if you notice here, I've justified it. So instead of just saying, oh, Agile is useful because it allows, um, I don't know, multiple people to work on the program at the same time, a justification means that you're showing the reasons why it's important for it. Cool, so describe one compatibility issue and then one performance issue to this um, solution. So because we've already started thinking about it, the compatibility issue is pretty obvious um, depending on the system. So if you're using, for example, an iPhone, you might um, 
be totally different compared to an Android system. So there might be different frameworks that work behind the scenes. Um, iOS uses different languages behind the scenes. So uh, Unity, for example, would allow you to work on all of them, but you might have worked on Swift when you've built this app. And then all of a sudden you want to deploy it to an Android um, version on the um, Android version, which would then need Java. So then you would have to rewrite all your code, which would be a little bit of an issue. So um, when we focus on this, the compatibility issue might look at the different operating systems. So Android or iOS need to make sure that that, that code works. Um, I would have gone a little bit further here. I think I didn't talk about the languages in hindsight, which um, would be probably useful. So it works the same. Um, and it also does, it, it doesn't have any sort of issues where it lags or it breaks the code or one file that you typed, like you type in a particular word or whatnot, and then it doesn't know how to translate it. It, it, it just, you basically just want to make it work as it's going. The performance issues then, um, are a little bit different. So what you want to make sure is that, uh, you need to work out whether or not the information is going to be stored locally or remotely. So a database of this size with all those words and all those vocab, it's going to be quite sizable. Um, so if you're downloading it onto the phone, it might take a, up a significant chunk of the memory on top of the iPhone. So a lot of companies might look at storing it remotely, but then um, the other issue then is you've got the bandwidth issue. You're trying to translate this word and it's got to go off to the server, the local server somewhere else on the cloud. And it's got to, the information is then going to come back up and it's been translated. That that lag could actually um, delay how long it takes for the thing to process and then do it. it. It sounds like they want it to be pretty seamless. So they want, as the person speaking, for the information to be translated then and there. Um, so this by having that lag, it, it could make a few bit of impact in the long run, which could be difficult. So depending where the information is stored, but you might also want to be, make it so that it's stored remotely. So then the size and the, um, of the files on the, on the iPad or the iPhone is significantly smaller. Uh, so th it's gonna impact the speed of the trans um, translations that way. Um, and also locally, the, the device itself might not um, only have limited cap capabilities. So if you're trying to upload this on an older version, like an iPhone 6, for example, it might not necessarily have the processing or the RAM capabilities of being able to um, uh, run the program. So we need to be mindful that uh, the hardware is going to be able to support the, the software and be able to do what needs to happen inside of this. So the speed of the transactions need to be considered when you're looking at this. Um, Cause it, it's, it, you're basically going to say, I don't know, uh, Konnichiwa Watashi no Hendo Sensei. So you're going to say that word really quickly and then they're going to want that translation then and there. You're not going to want to wait 10 seconds and then all of a sudden the translation comes through and then the other person says the next conversation. Um, and again, I've seen this software work in the past and it's been pretty cool. Um, but yeah, you need to have uh, some level of performance that's attached to that. Cool. So now we're onto the more of the pseudocode section. So you'll find each of these exams, they're always a little bit different with the way they have this sort of this, this um, mixture of here's a written part. Now here's the coding part. Here's a written part. Here's the coding part. Generally, you'll find the back half of the exam will have more of the pseudocode, like the heavy, heavy lifting ones, um, which will always, I, I say this most, most of the times there will always be a 2D array question. And then there'll always be some sort of relative or sequential file question at the back end of this. Um, so, and then this one's probably a bit more of an easy one. So this one's just showing your ability to use if statements and that you understand how an if statement works. So I've read through it. I've um, worked out that's just a, and um, as a teacher, what I try and do is try and give these type of questions. So it's a bit of a cookie cutter question. It's always gonna be a high or low um, that, that is a possibility. So if you see here, I, I drew a little tree diagram out the side there. So if it's correct, you're all good. If it's too high or if it's too low, um, it branches out appropriately there. So the computer generates a random number from one to 100. The player guesses until they've correct and have done 10 guesses. The output for each guess will be too high, too low, or correct. After 10 successful guesses, the number um, is displayed with the message, sorry, too many guesses. 
So you've got to design the algorithm and then the function random number generator has already been given to you. So random number literally spits out a number from one to 100. So you don't even need to do random number brackets one comma 100. You just literally go equals random number. So I've set the guesses equal to zero to start because you haven't made any guesses yet. I've then um, made a check variable to check to see whether or not you've gotten the correct answer because um, at the moment you don't. So if you check is equal to false and that's a Boolean flag basically. So it's gonna sit inside the while loop as it's going. And as soon as that's um, true, it's gonna execute it and then go on. So I've used a while loop for that reason because you want the game to successfully end as soon as um, the player has guessed the correct name. So I've used a while loop for that fact. So I'm gonna to check to see um, that true, the, the, sorry, I'm gonna to check to see that the check variable is set to false, right? And then I'm also gonna to check to see that the guesses is less than uh, the 10 guesses um, that's required. So as soon as it goes over 10 guesses, then you're done. So checking the guesses, um, probably use whiteout instead of my approach of just scribbling it out. Um, that's just because I didn't have any whiteout on me and I was just trying to punch this out. So while the guesses is less than 10, notice that I haven't done less than or equal to 10 because as soon as it's 10, you actually want the, the code exit. And then I've used an and statement to bind that together. And then I've said not the check. So if you understand anything about Boolean logic, check is just a value. So it's either true or false. So at the moment it's n not false, which is true. So that's all good. And then I've bound that with the other condition. So there's two things that will exit this while loop. It will either be that, that it's been found or that the guesses have gone above 10. So to start inside this um, bit of code now, um, we need to input something from the user. So each time that the person's guessing, you input into the guess. And then I've made um, the guesses equal to one. So I've incremented the guesses that we set up here originally. So guesses we originally set to zero. I've then um, added one onto that. Now I'm gonna use an if statement to check. So I'm gonna to check to see um, if the guess was correct. So the number that was randomly um, put in. So if the guess is equal to the number, then we're all good. The check then becomes true, and we um, print out, um, I think there was an output that we need to say, yep, correct. So check was the, would then equal true, and then um, we'd need to output, you're all good. So the output would then be correct. And that's, that's the perfect world scenario for this, this little um, bit of code. So if in a perfect world, if you wanted the code, um, if the guess to find out that it, it was found, then you'd be all good. Then there's the else part. So the else part is if it's too high or too low. So that's gonna be another if statement that's nested inside of this. And notice the indentation that I've done. So this next if statement's indented in another four spaces in. So then if the guess, I think I did was less than the number. So if the guess was less than the number, um, then you wouldn't change the check. The check would then still stay as false because nothing has happened. So then um, because the guess is less than the number, you would then need to say um, that it's too low. I think I scribbled that out a little bit more just to make it clear. Cool, go me. So. <laughs> Uh, you then need to output and then because the guess is less than the number you would then say uh, too low cool and then it's because it's an else it's a fork in the road it's either this or it's this you don't need to do another bit of the if statement or logic you just literally write else and notice any of these reserved words are written in capital letters that makes it a little bit easier to read so else the output then becomes too high. And because we're doing ordered pairing, we need to then end the, that if statement. And then we need to end the if statement above it. So we're gonna end that guy as well. And then we will end the while loop as well because there's nothing else we want to, to do yet. We then need to do a, a last check. So if it's gone 10, 10 rounds and it hasn't found it. So if um, check is equal to, um, still equal to false, 
which could potentially happen, you then want to spit out a sorry too many, too many guesses and you're not correct. Okay. So what happens here is you're looking and looking and looking and then you're trying to find um, whether or not the, the value has been found. And then that's what the last little bit there is. So at this stage here, you then go if um, check is equal to false, or you could have done not check as well. Sorry, it should be not check. I've changed it. No, I didn't. That's not correct. So it's not um, check. It should be not check. And then you would output the number and then say, sorry, too many guesses. So like I said, that bit of code, it's not 100% correct. It should have said, if not check. Um, sorry about that. These things happen. Sometimes you're writing too quickly and you forget. And then you end um, the guess my number. Cool. Next one, you got a system flow chart. Here we go. So you got your customer up the top and then you got your car. So this is just a story. And all you gotta do is write the story. That's what the describe part means. So describe in how the data in the files um, are used in the system. Um, and then just read it off. So I when I read through this, I started thinking, well, let's just start from the beginning. So the, the customer, what happens there with the customer database? And then how does that sort of look? So the customer can um, log in, so they've got to authenticate, and then they do that by inputting a username and password. So those trapeziums that you see are any of the inputs that are coming into the system, whereas the boxes describe the processes that occur, and then the cylinders represents the data stores or the databases that are gonna be used, okay? Anything with the little, um, the dog tag with the arrow tip at the end is any of the outputs that are coming from the database. Okay, so at the moment the customer can log straight away in with the username and password to authenticate themselves and if they're all authenticated then they get access into the, that customer database. That allows them to hire a car which means that they have information that they need to um, get from that. So if you look at the arrows, the username and password can only go into the authenticate process and um, the information doesn't pass straight to the customer it's only when they go through and hire the car. Okay, so if they've authenticated themselves and they try to hire that car, you can then um, get the re details and requirements of that car. And then it gives you back a list of all the different available cars that are available to purchase or rent, sorry. From the car's perspective, you would then be able to um, hire a car. So you need to see whether or not the car is available. If the car is available, then um, you can also then return the car at the end. So you've obviously hired the car and that's been done. And then the next process is then when you return the car at the end of the day. So when you return the car, um, you wanna pop in the car's registration number. So then you know that it's done and dusted. And then at the end, the output for that is confirming the cost of the car um, to the user. Uh, so with this bit here, um, I forgot to put the word database, so don't forget to do that. So a customer's database, a customer database can log in with your username and password to authenticate the users. This allows them to hire the car that is available and see the costs that are associated with it. So that describes the data in the files and how that it was used with inside of the system, which is what a system flowchart is done. A lot of misconceptions here is when you hear a flowchart, it's not the same as a system flowchart. So a flowchart is more of the pseudocode where it has an if statement in the diamonds with decisions and loops and all that type of things. Whereas system flowchart shows how does the data actually get stored and what are the inputs um, that need to occur inside of it. So then the car database um, then stores the information about the cars um, and allows you to work out um, based on the car registration number that you input, what's available to the customers, and then lists the options available and then gives the confirmation and the costs available to the car, um, the, car the customer as they go through and they've returned that car. Um, I think I didn't write so much about returning the car, which I probably should have done a bit more. So my advice with this is make sure you, you signpost 
these um, boxes as you're describing it. Um, just in hindsight, I should have said a little bit more about when they're returning um, the car. So what exactly happens in that space? Cool. So this one was another pseudocode question. So this was a binary search. So this is like when you search from numbers one to a million, what is involved inside of that? So you can find the halfway point and then work on either side of that. So if you're asked finding a number between one and a million, you can actually do that within 20 questions. So um, basically ask is the number above or below 100,000? Uh, sorry, 500,000. And if it is, either way, you get rid of 500,000 values, which is pretty cool. And then that narrows it down all the way until you're eventually at either above or below the point and there's nothing else that you can um, investigate. So in this case here, they've gone through seven numbers um, and it's checked to see if, the, um, if it's found. So there's a Boolean flag again. So it's set found is equal to false and high is greater than lower. So there's the high value, there's the low value. All of a sudden, the high goes below the lower value or the index value and then it exits the loop. So if we look through this, um, there's a little bit of errors as well because remember we, when we were reading through it, it said line 12 and 14 had some errors in it. So um, if we look at the search item, high is greater than index and low is greater than, um, is equal to the index if it's not. Um, what happens is there, I'm pretty sure there's an infinite loop. So when we do this, we've got a desk check occurring. So we just literally write the variables. So because I've highlighted it, do you see how this makes it easier? I'm just reading through where the highlighting is and then making sure that the variable has been listed. So it's either going to be low, a high, a found. Um, search item is another value that you're going to input into it and then index and then you got a list at that particular index and then also you got the output so print found at this particular index okay so um, my advice is to write try and write these as small as possible when you're doing the desk check just because um, usually what happens is there's not enough room and then you, you find that you're actually writing over the side which isn't as ideal so you got the low, high, found, the search item, the index, the list of the index, and then also the output at the end. So um, I, this is one of the few times that I would highly, highly recommend this. Make sure you bring a ruler into the class, into the HSC. Just makes it just that little bit cleaner um, for your marker as they're marking this. Um, so <laughs> this is what actually what's happening right here. I'm running off and trying to find my ruler. Um, it can be just a small one. Um, I personally like my, my long metal ruler just because it makes that um, a little bit cleaner. And then don't forget also the, the person that's marking this is a human. So the, the easier you make it for them to read, uh, they actually do appreciate that because they can see what your thoughts were in, in a nice reasonable way. Um, as you can see, my handwriting isn't necessarily the best. I am a computer scientist, so I prefer typing. Um, but by having some level of structure and just making sure it's a little bit easy for you, you, your teacher or the, the poor person that's marking this, you wanna make sure that it's a little bit of structure that's thrown into the mix just to give them that little bit of edge and it makes it a bit easier when you're um, wanting to try and prove to them that you are competent with how a desk check looks. So with this desk check, um, usually the first line is the initialization phase. So. I go through that and I'd literally put the low, the high, and then the found um, values in. So the low straight away was a one, the high was a seven, and then the found was equal to false. So you go one, seven, and then false. The input um, depends on what you're searching for. So they've, <laughs> they've asked for 42, the answer to everything, if you've watched Hitchhiker's Guide of the Galaxy. So 42, and then the index is gonna start at a particular value. So index, um, I just did a little bit of math here. So it's the integer part of the low plus the high divided by two. So you come back to the desk check and you would do the one plus the seven divided by two, and then it's the integer part of that. So if you wanna write that out, it doesn't hurt just so that you can get your head around inside of it. So then you looked up 44 um, in the, the table and it was 44. 
which is all good. And then was it found? No, because you're trying to find 42. So then you come down here, higher than equals index. And then um, because the search item is less than um, the, the current value that you're looking at, it's the high. So the high stays the same, but then the high now becomes the new index. So high equals four, and then you go again. So you're not, you haven't exited that loop from line six to 16. You then need to go through the next process. So you would go one plus the four divided by two, and then the integer part. So one plus four gives you five, and then five divided by two gives you 2.5. So then you're looking up the two. And then two currently has a value of 30, 38, and then 38, um, 42 is not less than 32, 38. So then you have to go to the other part. So then the low index gives you two. The high stays the same as the four. And then you go through the process of finding the index again. So the index is equal to the two plus the four divided by two, which gives you the three. Cool. So now you've got the three, you look up the index value, you get a 40. You then compare is 40 less than the 42. And what you should see straight away now, we, we have, we've, we've exit, we can't exit here now. So if we've got the 40, we then try it, try it again. So we're gonna go put the three in as the new low and then um, four as the high. And then the index is going to be the same again and again and again. So that's not going to work out so well in your favor, right? So then we're stuck into an infinite loop. Now writing that, you don't necessarily have to do that. But by doing that, um, I can guarantee you as a marker, it does make your life that much easier. Because you can see that the student understands the concept of what's happened. So to fix this, Basically, all you need to do is just shift it down one. Instead of just equal to the index, you actually want to make it to the left or the right of the index, depending on where it goes. So the high value, instead of it just equal to the index, um, when you pass that down, you want to actually shift it um, one down. So one more to the left. So the easiest way of doing that is you rewrite the statement. So you would say the line number, so you go 12, and then you go high and then equals. And then that's, if you've done that, you might get some part marks. Okay, but then if you get the right solution to actually shift it across, basically you want a minus one. So then it forces it to um, eventually get to a value. Because it's you've already checked the, the value that if, it, if you've just made it equal to index, it only looks at four. It doesn't look at, it doesn't need to look at it again. It's already examined that value. Okay, so by doing minusing one, it shifts it across. And then if you plus one, it shifts across into that section. It's kind of like doing um, quartiles when you do the lower quartile and upper quartile in math. Excellent, so then this one's a linear search. So um, there's the flag straight away in the, in the while loop. And like we've talked about before, the flag value is the thing that exit makes the loop exit itself if it's ever found inside of it. This makes the code more efficient. So for example, if the first value inside the array and you had an array of, you know, a billion values to search through and it was the very first one, it it stops that that code having to be executed a billion times. It only needed to be executed one. Okay, so it can significantly improve the code. However, the bad side of it, if, if the value that you were searching for was at the end of the array of a billion times, then unfortunately, um, this algorithm wouldn't work so well. Now, th th this is why when we talk about data, sometimes it's important to sort it. Now, if you sort your data in some sort of structure, it allows you to um, counteract that so that there are other processes that can be used. So um, found is the variable. Um, that is the flag that you're trying to look for. So it forces the linear search to exit the loop. So that while loop's gonna end straight away because found was um, done um, as soon as the code was found. And then I think I mentioned um, that if the code was, if the, the value that was being searched was found at the very beginning, so at the very first element inside of the while loop, then it would exit the loop, okay? 
So if you see there's some command words here, identify and then explain. So I, I'm pretty sure with the marking scheme, if you don't identify and say this is the value, right? So this is the variable, um, you wouldn't get as good marks, right? So you make sure you identify and sort of signpost it for your, your, your markers that are going through this because then it's going to make their lives easier. And then they're going to have that happy mode of just ticking away and going, yes, this person knows exactly what they're doing. Okay, so improving the efficiency because um, it's found in the first part. Okay, and then it stops the code from having to go through over and over and over and over on all these different things, which we don't want to happen. Awesome, so the iteration um, gets stopped there. Uh, yeah, and it's basically what we just talked about then. So it stops the iteration and helps improve that efficiency. The subroutine is match. So you've got a string and then a substring. So it needs to check if a string is inside of a bigger string. And you have these following routines available to you. So you have the length of the string and then the extract um, of the string. So it extracts the exact length from the string from a set start position and then the length given the string inside of it. So basically, if you've got a string, you're trying to see if that string is inside of the other string, all right? which involves checking each of those individual characters. Um, the good part is they've already given you the extract code. So you just need to know, you don't need to have, know how to do that. You just need to have, know how to reference it and use it appropriately. So they've given the example there, software. If you use the extract um, function, it will spit out two comma four and give you oft w. So I think down the bottom here, I wrote um, just a sentence just to get my head around it. So the cat walked would be the big string and then the small string, I think I did cat. So then what would be the algorithm? I would start at one, then I'd um, go to two, then I'd go to three, then I'd go to four, and then I'd go to five, and then check to see if the length of that string um, existed inside of it, okay? So this was just me trying to get my head around what I would be doing. So um, there'd be a loop obviously involved in this. Um, and I'm trying to find when cat exists inside each time. So there's gonna be a found variable again because you wanna to check to see whether or not this thing's been found um, or check, I think I did, can't remember. Um, and basically what's gonna happen is it's gonna go through that loop um, from posi each position across. And then if it gets to that position and the thing is present inside of it, then it exits the loop. Cool, so I've made found is equal to false. So that means that the, at the present, the loop hasn't found any of the values. I then also did the lengths so I've, I've jammed them into variables instead of having to reference that every single time. So the big length is equal to the length of the big string. And then the small length is the small length of the, um, the, the normal string or the string that's um, been used to search. So the big string would be the cat walked and then the small string would be cat. Um, and then by doing that, I don't have to rewrite that function every single time. I just get to, I get to use that throughout, which helps improve the efficiency of when I'm writing the algorithm. It also helps getting your head in the game of trying to work out, oh yeah, that's gonna be sort of important trying to work out that there's gonna be you know, seven characters and then there's gonna be three characters inside of this and then so on. So it is pretty important to have some sort of structure like that. Um, and also because we're using uh, positions like it's done there, we, we're not starting from zero like a lot of programming languages do. So we're actually starting with the first element inside of the string is at position one, which does give, um, there's always a huge debate on this of like, what's the appropriate way? Personally, I prefer zero because that's what most languages do. Um, but contextually, it does help sometimes to get your head around because when you say that the first position and it's one, it is a little bit easier um, to do. So this part here, I was trying to get my head around um, what to do exactly here. So I'm looking at this, trying to work out what would the while loop do. Um, the other part is I need to work out how long does the loop need to go. So if, we, if we've got cat, for example, it's got three characters. 
we don't actually need to go all the way to the end of um, the full first sentence of the big the big string. So when we want to do the end length, it's literally the length when does this end um, that needs to be searched. So for example, this one down here, we wouldn't need not to, we'd only need to go up to the K. We wouldn't need to do E and D because otherwise that's not useful. So to find that, all I've done is the big length minus the small length. And because we're not starting at zero, we actually have to add one on just to shift it across. Because um, otherwise, potentially, you could have a string that's the same size, and then it won't. The, this would break the code. So um, I've gone for i is equal to one, all the way through to the end length. So the length of um, where we need to check up to. So we don't need to check all these values inside, because we don't. If it's got three characters, or if it had four characters, we could stop here. If it had six characters, we could stop at the w, because once we get past that, it's not going to be able to find the substring. That's what that little bit of code there does. So then we're going to go through and do the substring is equal to, um, I'm going to extract out of it where we're currently up to. So we're up to the I. So each time we've gone through here, these are the different values. And then we want to say, this is the string. So we're going to go into the big string. We're going to start at I. And then the length of it is the small length. So we just put in, type in, or not even type, sorry, we're just writing the small length. And then that would, that's going to spit out whether or not that substring um, uh, can be um, stored. So it's going to store it as a string. And then literally we're just going to check to see. So we're going to go, if the substring is equal to the string, then we're all good found is equal to true because we found it so that that little substring that you wanted to pop out was inside of it so you're all good so found now equals true and also notice when I write boolean statements I always put um, the values true and false in capital letters just because they're, they're pretty much our reserve words as well and just signifies the marker that you've understood what's happened you then end that if statement, you then um, finish, wrap up the, the for loop. So this is like curly brackets. So you've got next i, so that means that the for loop will then iterate across the next i value. So we'll go i is equal to one, then two. You then would want to return um, found. So if it's been found, you want it to say it's true or it's false. And then you want to end um, the is match function. Cool. Next one, E, B, and F. So this is a little bit trickier. Um, so we're going to be writing up a function that describes a multi-way selection statement. Now, when we do multiple, this is like switch statements in Python um, or uh, uh, switch statements in um, C Sharp, which is what we've done as well. And basically what you're going to do is look at the structure. So if we're writing a definition for a multi-way multi -way selection statement, the first bit is you did write is multi-way selection is equal to. Okay, so you want to write that, and then you want to write all the different options that can need to happen. So to start, it always has a select, and it always has case, but it also has um, capital letters for select. So I've just written a one, two, three there just to get my head around it. So select with capital letters, and then we're going to write case in lowercase, because every single one of those has that same, exact same structure every single time, otherwise it's not a case statement. So we've gone select, we then go case, and then what we're gonna look at is how do those conditions and statements intertwine, okay? Now this is, this is a little bit trickier. When you're looking here, you don't have to write out the exact terminal values. So it doesn't have to have X, X's and Y's and tens and equals and how does a conditional statement works. They've wrapped that all up in the less than and greater than symbols. So you don't have to rewrite, reinvent the wheel necessarily here, okay? Which is really cool and super useful, okay? So if you look at the first case, it just has um, a condition and then it has a statement that's attached to it. The second case um, then has that. And then in the third case also has that, okay? Now to wrap up what an option is, I've actually wrapped it together um, as a separate thing. 
So when you see um, the less than greater than symbol it means that I'm binding this together just to show what an option actually looks like. So rather than having to rewrite and um, the, the complexity every single time if there's not just one or multiple, um, I've just literally written it as an option which looks like this. So an option needs to have a condition first and then it must have the column and then it must have a statement or multiple statements afterwards. So we'll have a statement. And then if you look um, in the first one, it will have, um, it, can, it can either be a single statement, but there will always be at least one statement. And then you can have multiple statements afterwards, um, each time separated by a semicolon. And I forgot the left hand side of the um, less than symbol there. So sorry about that. Then, what are we doing next? Did I fix it? I don't know. Hopefully I fix it. Let's see what happens. Um, right, so then the next part is we can have one option to start, but then we can have multiple options afterwards. Right, so if you look at condition number two, it has two options, but then it also has an otherwise at the end. So we would be using curly brackets, so you can have zero or multiple other options after the fact. Okay, then we get down the bottom and then there's an otherwise involved. Okay, now the otherwise, if you look at it, there's only one otherwise, there's not multiple otherwises. So that's optional. Okay, so we're going to need to use our square brackets instead of the curly brackets. So the curly brackets are used when there's repetition involved. The square brackets, they're used when um, you're looking at it going, oh, it's either this or it's not. So square brackets are selection. I always think of square brackets like if statements and then curly brackets are like your loops. So the square brackets and then you write otherwise all in capital letters. Okay. And then if you look down the bottom, it doesn't have anything after that. So you can technically have just otherwise and be done with it. And then on the other side of that, you can then have um, a statement. Okay. And then that's also optional. So you can have um, just a statement or you can have multiple statements. At the end and then you can just finish that off with a square bracket hopefully I do that and then each time that you add a statement it's like what you did inside the options so you'll need to put a semicolon between each one as you add them in Great. And then at the end, you need to end the select statement. So then end the select. Now they, they are a little bit trickier. Um, my advice with those is just make sure curly brackets for multiple things, square brackets for optional. Awesome. So then this part here is the fetch deadly eel safely. So <laughs> I always get my kids to write this just because it's, it's a legacy item now. And usually I'll, I'll do a little bit of a giggle moment and redraw my dodgy eel and me trying to fetch it safely. Okay. Um, <laughs> I didn't even spell deadly right. I was that <laughs> I was trying to go that fast. <laughs> so there's my eel. And the whole point behind this is that you're trying to break down it's a little anagram to trick you into remembering what fetch execute means. So fetch is where you gather um, stuff from the RAM. Decode is when this control unit takes what that instruction is and tries to work it out. Execute is when it goes to ALU and then executes the code. 
and then store is where it takes that information and puts it back into RAM. So it's like this little circle. Okay. Now the fetch execute cycle gives you away two of those already, right? So eels is execute. Um, the only two that you gotta remember then is decoding and storing. So the fetch part for this one here, and we're considering the following code fragment that was stored in RAM. How will, how the instruction sub will be done. So sub looks like a subtraction function. Uh, so it subtracts the contents of B from A. So the program counter is currently looking at that. So it's looking at the sub, it's not looking at the store because remember program counter only goes line by line. So the program counter is pointing at the sub um, R3 comma R1 comma R2. And when it's pointing at it, that means it's now gonna go through and try to execute that part. So this is the fetching part. And then it wants to execute that operation. So it wants to take, um, I think it takes the contents of B away from A. So whatever's in R1 gets taken away from R3 and then eventually stored into the um, register C. So R2 would then store it. Now each of those registers, remember they're just little boxes or think of them as variables. So when we decode it, we're looking at decoding that instruction. So it would read that instruction that um, was given there. So sub, sub A, B, C. So it takes the sub op code um, and then lets the, the control unit know what's up. So it goes, whoop, hang on. You need to be thinking here. So the control unit um, knows the traction needs to happen. And it's looking at, well, hey, hang on, how do I do this? And then, yeah, pretty much, that's pretty much the decoding part. So once it's done that, though, the program counter can then also change. Um, I think the hint here is because they've given you two lines of code, so they've got the subtract R3, R1, R2, and then underneath it, it's got the store um, part. Now that store part has another value, right? Uh, the other the other thing that we haven't really talked about is opcodes and operands. So the opcode is the first part, which basically is the instruction that you want the um, control unit to consider. So sub would be the opcode. And then the store would also be the opcode for the next value down below it. So subtract opcode, let's just see control unit then take the values. Um, and then also the program counter is now going to be pointing. It's um, then shifted the point across. Okay, so it's now going to point at the store, R2, R3. Okay, so that's what decoding does. The next bit then is the execute phase. So we're going to actually execute the code. So this is where subtract actually gets... Um, Done. And then this always happens in the ALU or arithmetic logic unit. And inside the ALU, there's a whole heap of different things that happen. Okay. ALU pretty much me does adding. That's the easiest way of thinking about it. So whatever was stored in R3 is placed inside of a thing called the accumulator, which stores all that information. So the accumulator is going to sit there waiting for the information um, to be played around with. Now the accumulator is just like, a, I always think of it like a flashlight. Like currently this ALU is focusing what's inside the accumulator and it accumulates different values that get inputted and outputted inside of it. The R1 then is taken away from the value that is currently stored in the accumulator. So R1 isn't taken away from R3. It's done inside of this thing called the accumulator. That's the easiest thing to think about when you think about that execute part. Okay. So it's done by the ALU. ALU works out, oh, yep, this, this is what happens. This is the logic that needs to occur behind the scenes. And then once that's all done, it then stores the final output. So it stores the value that's inside that accumulator, gets then inputted into the R2 value. Okay. 
Okay, so that final value that's then um, currently stored in the accumulator gets then popped into R2. And then eventually R2 would then get um, pushed into RAM. That's the next part. Cool, and then I think I drew a little diagram. Yep, so I drew a diagram. So on the right, it's the RAM. On the left would be the control unit. On the bottom would be the AL unit. And then it goes back into RAM. So ALU does the, um, the calculations. Cool, nearly there. So this is where it gets to the heart of parts. So 33 um, is a, a referencing file. So this is one of the bigger questions. So remember how I talked about there's always a 2D array question and then some sort of file um, question. This is the file question. So when you're looking at this question, I'm pretty sure this is the last one as well, lucky number 33 you're looking at the structure behind the scenes, okay? So you're gonna begin um, reading through this whole problem and you need to think about what each record does and how they're related and what they do. Sorry again for that, I didn't have this quite on the screen. I'll hopefully bring it back across. <laughs> so um, when I'm reading through this, I see that the employee ID is the key um, I then also see that it has to be a five digit number to validate it um, over time. And then it has ID, um, the employee ID. And then down the bottom there, there's, there's an if statement that's occurring. So if it is valid, these are the operations that need to happen. If it's not valid, this is what needs to happen. And if you look carefully, um, I'll, I'll have this uploaded on the, um, the Google Drive link down below. If you can't quite see that, which I'm sorry again that we can't quite see. Um, lesson learned, I definitely won't do this again. Um, what I try to do is write out roughly what needs to happen inside of that green area first and make sense of it before I start writing, okay? It's very easy um, to get your head around what needs to happen before um, you actually just start writing. So when you begin um, this, I've called this function check over time. And then you need to open the overtime file first. Now this is what's um, going to be uploaded into the system. So that's why it's open. And then it's for input. So it's not for reading and writing. It's just for um, writing, which is what input does. Okay. And then there was a sequential file. Hopefully I pick up and bring that across a bit more so you guys can see what I'm doing. So there's the employee and then there's the overtime. So there's two files at play here. So the employee had the name, the, the, the attributes of what an employee was. So their ID, their name, and if they are to be paid over time. And then the overtime literally logs, the overtime file literally logs how much overtime they've done. So they're two separate files that are happening here. So it's open the overtime um, for, a, uh, for input and then it's opening the employees file um, which is going to be a little bit different because it's a bit more relational because you can actually access those different records of the employee and then change different values inside so that there is a little bit more of an intricacy here so you're opening the employees file for relative access And then the first step is you want to read who who's doing what. Okay, so the, the trick here is you want to read the employee ID. Um, if you read through the, the code that was given inside the little pseudocode part, employee ID has to be capital letters and that needs capital ID as well at the end. And then you also want to get the hours that this employee is done, which is what those two um, parts of the column are. So there's the employee the ID and then the hours from the overtime file. So that's what this, this one down here is. And then the one above it um, is um, the actual records of the, um, the, the different employees, okay? So while it's not the end of the file, so you opened up employees, you've read the employee ID, and now you're up to the while 
um, not the end of the file. What we're going to be looking for here is we're looking at that particular employee ID and then how does that information um, get added together of how many um, extra hours that this, this person's worked, right? So if you're thinking, I know, of a McDonald's shop, um, employees obviously work over time from time to time and you need to have some way of structuring it so that this thing can store and record how many hours that this, this, this person's worked and then use that information to make a calculation of how much they've actually um, in total throughout their career at the store worked over time because that is important. So you've read from the um, overtime file first and then you're checking to see um, if the particular section that you're looking at, so the employee ID is, um, is uh, an integer. So first of all, is it a whole number? Because remember, it's any five digit number. Then you also want to check if the employee ID is greater than zero. So if you want to see whether or not, because um, you can't have a negative integer here, and because it's five digits, you then can go and the employee ID is less than or equal to 9999. Yeah, so five nines in a row. Now what happens there is you've basically effectively checked off that it's an integer and then also that the employee ID is within that range. It could be um, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. It could be 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 5. Just, it just matters what, what you're going to do. Now I ran out of space here. Personally, um, yeah, I just it was too rushed. Um, with these type of questions, what I try and do is make sure that you're, write, you're writing pretty narrow. Um, you can get away with that. So if the employee ID is an integer and the employee ID is greater than or equal to one and the employee ID is less than or equal to nine, 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 then we're all good, we're good to go. Um, the other thing that you need to consider here um, is whether or not the employee ID is valid. So if the person actually exists because if the person doesn't exist, then there's another um, bit of trouble and a bit of chaos that gets thrown into that mix. And it's hard, right? You're, run, you're working with two different tables. You're working with this overtime table and then the employees table. And when you're looking at them, the, the employees table, it might not necessarily be obvious straight away. Um, the trick with when reading through this was that I could see that there was clearly this table at the start that had the employees ID, um, and name and then whether or not um, how many hours they've worked and then a separate table which was pretty obvious when you saw it of all the time that they did over over time so we're reading this um, employee ID and hours from the overtime so it's very important that we're focusing on one part we're not doing both of them at the same time so we're reading the employee ID and then we read the employee ID into these two variables. So we go name and overtime using that employee ID. So that, that ID is almost a reference that we've typed in to look up a particular value. Then the employee ID, oh, sorry. Um, what What's happened here is we've made a record effectively. So we've made a record called imp, which is the employee and then we're going to be able to um, pull out of it those two bits of information. So the name and then also um, how much overtime they worked. So employee.overtime hours, we're now going to equal that and add on one, which is going to add on um, the employee hours that have um, been taken out. And then we're going to write the employee overtime hours um, from this system back into the top. So this, this EMP is just a record in the system. And then we need to add that onto the system. So it's writing it back, um, the name and then the overtime flows using the employee ID. 
and then else that if that isn't true so if it isn't a valid number we need to say something to the user saying this isn't so good so when we were output here we're literally looking at it and going well that wasn't quite correct what do we do Um, cool, so it's going to output the employee ID that you've typed in is not valid, um, which is then a little bit of a trouble. And then we end the if, so we've got an if statement at the top, and then we need to um, close that all out. So else is done. And yeah, that's pretty much that bit done. So the, it's read the file. Um, for the two different areas, it's made, it's said very clearly that overtime is for input and then employees is for relative access. It's read it from the overtime and it's checked to see if the number is valid. And then if it's not, it's all good. And then it's literally added on um, the hours that the employee has done as overtime. It then reads the employee ID in hours from the overtime again. Okay, and this is, this is what um, pre-processing is all about. That's why we had to write that read first. Otherwise, it's it's not going to know whether or not it's at the end of the file. So this is like kind of like post-testing. And then you need to close the file. So we close the employees and close the overtime. And then we end the check over time. Cool. So like I said, we focused more on the, on the hardware. Um, the reason why we focused on that was just because it was, um, like I said, I'm a bit of a math nerd, so it's a bit easier for me to get through. And yeah. So to start, we've got the binary representation, the ASCII code for the upper le uppercase letter L is 01001000. What's the hexadecimal representation of the code for the uppercase M? So M's obviously the next letter up, so we just added one on. So the binary representation of capital letter M would be 01001100. Right, and then because we want to do hexadecimal, the trick with that is you just do it in groups of four because when you do going from binary to hexadecimal, if you group it in four, it's super easy. All you gotta do is convert that four digit code into its hexadecimal counterpart. So the first one is four because it's just zero, one, zero, zero, which is one in the four column. And then the other one's a little bit trickier. So it's gonna be a letter probably. Um, it's gonna be one, one, zero, one. So it's gonna have an eight, a four, and then a one. So eight plus four is 12, 12 plus one is um, 13. And then 13 in um, hexadecimal is D. So that's why it's a 4D. The next one down the bottom, 8-bit um, um, number. So if you've got 32 times 5, I would do 32 times 5 just to start, just to get my head around what, what's happening in the system. So when you do 32 times 5, I'm pretty sure, what was it 160? So um, yeah, it's 160. And then straight away, because I'm doing 2's complement, I'm getting concerned because it's greater than 127, okay? So 160 being greater than 127, there's some issues in that. And then we need to go through and sort of break that down. So what I would do is just work out, that because it says, I'm sure you're working for binary multiplication, there's gonna be a mark attached to that. So you better do it. Um, with eight bits, I try and do it in groups of four, like the hexadecimal thing that I showed you before. Um, it makes my easy on my brain trying to work through it. And then, yeah, so fill in the blanks. And then always try and put the bigger number at the top when you do multiplying as well. Now, because it's times 101, uh, there's only three extra lines that you really technically need to write. And then what I try and do is put X's in when I've ever shifted across um, a particular column. So wherever you see an X, that just means zero. Okay, so that. And then because it's eight bits, um, technically I should have put two zeros in on the other end. Um, I've put X's all the way through there because nothing happens because it's zero times everything else. 
and then this one here should be in the cross shifted across two and then it should have zero 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 one so five zeros and then a one but then the problem is if you've picked up on two's complement already there's a one now in the um positive and negative place so then it's not going to actually represent the 127 so if we kept that as zero and there was a one it was all one one, one, one that would be 127 using two's complement but because there's a one there now we have to use two's complements negative version of that which is not necessarily the same value okay technically it would be um wherever you see a zero that would all be swept swapped to one and then you would take away one and then that would be the negative value of that number okay so uh two's complement was useful here so the binary numbers of 32 and 5 um, could be done, but you would need another bit. So instead of eight bits, you probably put another byte in there. So it would be a 16 bit number. Um, that way it would, it would remove any of these um, miscommunications and sort of misunderstanding of um, how they sort of connect. Okay, so the first de digit, whenever you're using two's complement, always represents whether the number is positive or negative. Because it was a one, it means that it's representing a negative number. And then 8-bit numbers um, in two's complement literally have to have that pattern. Otherwise, it's not actually using the two's complement approach. So you need to be a little bit mindful of that when you're looking there. Okay. But yeah, X is for wherever the decimal place shift needs to happen. Okay. And then this number can only go up to 127. Righto, so then this one here, um, this is just like Boolean um, normal algebra. What you try and do is look for rules and then apply the rule. So in this case here, there's a C naught in each of those f three terms. So that A naught, B naught, A, A naught, B, C naught, and then A, B, C naught, and then A naught, A, B naught, C naught. So you can take a C naught out the front and then you're left with A naught, B plus A, B, then plus A, B naught. And then they've given you a little bit of a hint here with the truth table part. If you look at everything inside of the brackets, it's actually um, only got two variables. So you can actually map out the truth table and work out what's true and what's false of what's inside of that brackets. And then because AB doesn't exist anywhere else outside of the brackets, this is the only reason why we can do this approach. So what I did is I put the numbers. So I did um, a, B, and then 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So um, 0, 0 is the same as, um, so, so I've said X is the same as everything that's inside the brackets. I haven't really written it out like a good mathematician. Technically, I should have said let X equal to A naught B plus A B plus A B naught. But that's okay. So um, 0, 0 means A naught B naught, which is 0. And then the other three are there. So you've got um, A, B naught. Uh, sorry, A naught B is the first term. Um, A, B naught is the second one. And then A, B is the last one. Right. So then that's the same as saying A or B, if you look at the truth table, which is what that is, where you've, I've represented it. Now, the, the track with, trap with this one is it needs to be in four gates. So if you just left it as the previous example, it would not be possible to do it in four, four gates. Okay, even if you did this, the taking the C out the front, it would not allow you to do it in four gates, which is a significant problem. So yeah, I went back and then did the let the X. So to start, you would then have your inputs. So you would go A, B, C, and then you would just draw that gate out. So I would probably start with the A or B. So bringing A or B into an um, OR gate. I would then do the NOT C, which would then flip it. So the OR gates always represented as the Star Trek symbol. So that, that's the way I remember it. And the AND gates look like a D. That's the other way. Uh, the NOT gates look like a triangle and it's inverted. So it's got the little circle at the front. And then you bring both of those into um, an AND gate which is represented as the D and then that spits out at the end. So that's what the truth table should look like. Um, the Boolean gate looks like that. Without the truth table, that might be a little bit difficult to do. 
Righto, so then we're up to this part here. So we've got a student designing the following logic circuit for um, any two bit numbers. And we're gonna input 11 and one. So 11 is the same as three, so three plus one. And we should get a four or 100 as the output. So in the first gate, we've got um, an XOR gate. So we've got one and one. So I'd found just by writing the little ones above each um, gate. Uh, each line as it inputs in helped me trying to get my head around what needed to go where and what, what was the value. So we had a one or a one, um, one X or one. So because they're both ones that actually is off, so that means no um, flu um, no connectivity happens there. Then the next one was an AND gate with a one and a one coming into it. So that would output then a one into that OR gate down the bottom there. Then we had um, a zero or a one with an XOR gate. So that zero and one comes through, which gives us a one, which then is the problem. So because there's a one there, that's actually technically not correct. Like the gate, the logic system that's in play here is not um, authorized to do it for every single um, different combination that you could have. So that gives you a one. And then the X, we've got the the all parts, we've got the one from the output from um, the, the ones columns. Now we need to get that last flow in from the AND gate. So we've got um, two inputs coming in. So we've got the one from the AND gate from the number one. And then we've also got the zero um, for the first number, which gives us one. So zero or one gives us one. Cool. And then I think down the side here, I did 11 plus one, which gives us 100. So therefore it's not, it's outputting, it says it's outputting, it should output four, but it's actually outputting six, which is a problem. So then that means the Y value has the error inside of it. So the Y um, Output doesn't necessarily have the values that needed to come into it. Therefore, it's it's freaking out a little and then it doesn't know how to process it or calculate it. So the circuit um, incorrectly outputs the different values. So it outputs 110 when it should be outputting one, um, 100. So Using the output values, identify why the circuit does not always produce the correct result for addition of any two bit digits. So the Y value um, is where the error is. So the Z value should be fine at the moment with this current test. Uh, the X value looks okay. So there might be some other gates that need to be inputted into this or some of them uh, removed. My gut's telling me that there needs to be something else added in um, just to make those half adders um, add together appropriately and but the, the thing is the question isn't asking you to create a, a perfect solution it's not saying that you need to fix this gates and get it perfect it's just to identify where the issue is so using these values not always current work out where the issue is and then it doesn't hurt if you can explain um, roughly what are the things that are wrong with it and then how, how could you solve it Yeah, it looks like that's what I've done is I've gone through and I've looked at it and gone, yep, the carrying's not happening. So one plus one um, should give you 10. So that should spit out a zero and then um, carry the one across, but it's not carrying it. So the carry from the first digit isn't um, working. If you're looking at, um, at the output or the Y value basically doesn't connect. And because it's not been applied to it, that's where the issue is. So it's thinking, well, what's the next step? So it needs to be able to go across to the next column, um, which is not doing appropriately. So that AND gate there um, doesn't work. 
outline the structure of a typical data stream. So this is where um, the header data block and then the trailer um, sits in. So the header is what um, identifies the message. So it, it sort of determines if it's a, if it's got parity bits in it. Um, some levels of networking even have um, addresses saying whether does this thing need to be delivered to. You then have the data block, which is then defining um, what needs to occur. And then the trailer at the end, which is um, the parity bit. And then also um, uh, whether or not it's the end of the file. Okay, so the start has the header. And because it says outline, you don't need to go to extensive depth here. Like you just need to briefly describe what it has. So the start has a header. Um, that indicates the start of the file. So that means that there's a stream that's occurring, um, which is what the header basically says. And then inside the data block could store all this information. So for example, the printer example that you can see down below, that would have the data blocks, which is the instructions um, that need to be applied to the hardware device that you're passing this all this information across to. And then at the end, you got your trailer. So the trailer is literally the um, error checking and then also signifying that it's the end of the process. So at the end down the bottom there, you literally would have um, either a parity bit or a trailer um, uh, number just to say that it's at the end. And then this allows the data stream to check to see if there's any errors that have been happened in the transmission as it's gone across in the data stream. Cool, so now down the bottom here, you've got your 3D printer question. And there's two parts. So there's a 2D version and then a 3D version. So the 3D printer um, uses plastic, comes out of the nozzle and cooled down. The nozzle can be directed to a specific position and can be opened or closed. A 3D printer is produced um, by printing a series of separate lines on top of layers, i.e. down below. If you played around with 3D printer, that makes this a lot easier because you can contextualize. So the way the printer works, is it draws on this plat platform and then if it needs to do the um, Z axis or up or down, it literally will push down the, um, the platform. So because the first one's just 2D, we're worried about that. So an X coordinate has um, inside of it seven bits and then the Y coordinate has seven bits. And at the start, it either has a one zero or a one one. And if it's one zero, it means that the nozzle is open. So it allows, um, ink or the filament to come out and then one one means it's closed so because there's seven bits that means it can only go up to 127 and if you look down the grid see how it's gone up to 126 so that's a pretty good indication that we're on the right track of thought there and then it's given five instructions to set right and then this is going to produce the layer now because it's in um, binary my advice here is to change it into English so that you're not as confused so at the start there I looked at it, it went one one, that means close, one zero means it's open. So therefore I wrote whether it was closed or open for each of those values. So if it's closed means no filaments coming out, means that the nozzle will move to that position, then it will execute whatever's been told afterwards. So uh, it says 16, 16, so I converted that into binary and all I did was just jump across. Um, the next one was a little bit more complicated, so I had 16 plus 32 because I had a zero, one, one, and that was the same in the other one. And then the last one, sorry, the third one there has one, zero, one. So then that's a little bit trickier. So it's got 16, um, and it's got 64 plus, what would be 16, which gives you 80. So then that, that's what the other one goes to. And then the next one down, um, some of these start repeating themselves so you can steal from it other way, elsewhere. So that's going to be the same as 48. So you can just pop 48 in there. And then the last one's going to be a little bit trickier. So it's going to be 64 plus 32 plus 16 because it's got a 1110000. Um, sometimes it helps as well if you want to draw um, little lines down between each bit. So then you can cut it off and go, okay, that's actually what needs to happen. So 64 um, plus 16 is the trick. So you get 80 and then 80 plus 32 gives you 112. So that's 112. Then you have 
um, the 48 again, and then the 64. So you see by converting it first, rather than trying to start drawing it, is a lot easier. So try and write it into a language or a number system that you actually understand. That's my hint with this question. So start off, it goes 16, 16. So the little ink bit goes across, goes 16, then drops down and plonks. And then it opens up and moves down to 48. So then it moves down there to 48. And again, rule is very useful here. So it's not as scratchy. And then the next one, it goes up to 80, 16. So 80 in the x-axis and 16. So it means it's going up. So you draw a line from there to there. And then underneath it, it closes itself and moves down to 48, 1, 1, 2. So that means it's gonna move all the way down into the middle of that V, but down to 1, 1, 2. So I'm gonna put a dot there. And then it opens itself up and goes up to 64. So what you're gonna have a line that doesn't quite touch, it's gonna to be one box below where the bottom of that V is. So then get the ruler out again that in and then connect now technically I'm not drawing that right it should be going from the bottom up but that's okay um, now I thought that didn't quite look as obvious so um, what I would do in an exam situation I'd actually go grab the highlighter which is what I'm doing here just so that it's very clear to the marker that you understood um, where the movement needed to happen so that's what happened there and then that what that's what happens there Fantastic. So then the next bit is the 3D version of this. So I'm just gonna leave that up the top there just in case I need it for later. So the data block to the printer um, contains the following control characters. So you've got one that um, drops the cradle next to the layer printed. So that basically pushes it down. So once it's done the 2D version, it then needs to get the push down. It then specifies the start um, the start of the repeated set of instructions to be repeated n amount of times, where n is an 8-bit binary number. Um, drop the, cape, the cradle, the following 16-bit instruction is sent to the printer. So that's what the escape FF, so that's what the first one was, because F is the same as 1111. Create the data block containing the required instructions to print a small three-sided box with the top or the bottom, the 16 by 16 by 16 units, and starting at 0, 0. So to start, what you're gonna need is um, to define um, the beginning of the loop. So this is exactly the same as the normal programming loop, right? So it's the same as if, um, sorry, whiles or for loops and all those type of things. Um, all I did there was I converted the FFF, um, just to confirm in my brain. So FFF is the same as 11111. Probably gonna do the same with 0A and then 1A as well from memory. Um, and then the escape character is that special character that you see inside the box, which is the 00011011. And then, yeah, we basically need to use the escape, um, the second command first, right? So that's the same as a while loop. That's the um, easiest way of thinking about it. So it starts at a particular, um, it tells where it needs to start each time, okay? And you want it to start at the corner zero zero, so that's just going to be what the position is. Okay, so you basically want it to start at zero zero, and then you want it to make a sixteen by sixteen three sided box, and then it's going to be sixteen layers high. Okay, so you want that box to start in the corner. Um, technically, the, the the code that you did from before helps you with this because you're pretty much just repeating um, the instructions. Uh, that needed to happen there. That that sort of gave you some hints of how opening the, 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 the nozzle worked and then closing the nozzle and then how that each bit connected. So at, out of those three commands at the start there, you just need to use the second one. So you need to put an escape character first and FFF. Now I think what happened here is I started trying to write it out and then I got a little confused. To fix that, what I did is just wrote the pseudo code above it. So instead of getting confused and trying to work out where the zeros and ones go, um, I actually wrote out in English uh, or pseudocode-ish. And then underneath, um, I then start converting it. So that first bit there is the escape character, which is the 001111, I think it was. And then, yeah, here we go. I'm converting all the zero A's and then the one A as well. So zero A would look like that. 
So that's what needs to go after that escape character. And then the zip 1A would be 0, 0, 001 um, 1, 0, 1, 0, which would be the escape character. And then there's the next code. So that's kind of like the op codes. That's what the 1A represents. That's, that's the code control code that needs to be applied inside of this bit of program. So from there, um, we're now going to go through and um, write the next bit, which should be the 0A. So I've done the escape character to start, and now I'm going to go 0A afterwards. So I'm going to go 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And then I need to do it 16 times. So I need to have um, the code for what 16 is, an 8-bit binary number. So an 8-bit binary number is um, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, which so one with four zeros after it is what 16 is in um, binary. And then, yep, yeah, here we go. Here's me writing the pseudo code out. So I'm going to go 0, escape, 0A, zero, 16. And then after that, because um, that's how many loops we need to do, it's going to go through 16 times of the next bit of code. So then it's going to go through um, with an open, sorry, close nozzle first. So it's going to move to the close nozzle bit there. And then it's um, going to have the seven bit characters, which is one of the things I got confused with this. So I, I tried to write the numbers zero and eight bit characters when it should only be seven, which was one of the traps here. So it's going to be closed down to zero, zero. And then uh, I think I move 16 to the left. So open and move 16 across and then zero up and then open again. So keeping the thing open, you want then want to go to 16, 16. And then the last movement that you need to do with the nozzle open is then go um, to 16, uh, 0, 16. So that's one layer. So that would make the little reverse C here. Once it's done that, um, you then want it to go drop a layer. So you, you've, you've finished that layer, so then you want to go down one, which is what um, the first code does. So escape FFF will then drop it down. But then we also need to make sure that it's repeating, uh, specifies the end of the repeat of the instructions. So that's kind of like the um, when we've done while loops, you need to also have, if you've got end this, you need to have end while with it at the end. Uh, so I think what happened here is I, I saw the trap and I looked and was it was 7 bit instead of 8 bit. What was the other thing that I was seeing here? So escape and then you want it to drop down. So escape um, FF would then drop it down. And then the last bit is you want to know when the end of the loop occurs, which is what escape 1A does. So that's like the end while, or in some programming languages, we use curly brackets. Um, Python, we use indentation. Um, with most languages where it's down to the machine level, you need to be a little bit more explicit to stop it being trapped in an infinite loop. So the first bit there, um, you can see that I've done uh, the 0A. So I've done the escape character and then 0A. And because I've written in pseudocode, all I've got to do is just focus on um, putting the pieces, like it's almost like writing out a legend on a map and then putting the pieces of the puzzle into the places that it needs to go. So that bit here at the start is the escape character. And then this bit here is the A, 0A. And then now we need to write the 16 in binary afterwards and then um, write each of the open and close statements underneath it. So now we need to write the 16. So that's what the 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0 is. Then we just go into the instructions for the closed and open. Now, I think I got confused to start here and I actually did um, an 8-bit character instead of a 7-bit character, which is not what the requirements are. If you come back here, this is what the instruction for each layer as it's been printed does. So you need to be mindful of that if that's what the requirements are saying for it to do. 
So doing one, one, um, and then close would be zero, zero, zero. I think I did eight bits here. Instead, I should have done um, just seven, which is okay. So I, I'm pretty sure I caught on to this. Um, if this does happen in the exam, my advice would be to use some white out just to make it clear that that's not even part of um, the consideration. Yep, so you can see that I go there. Don't do that in the exam. <laughs> so learn from my mistakes. So I went one, one, and then I just did it in groups of seven. So I, went, I did seven zeros all in a row. And then another set of seven zeros. And then now it's, that's the open version. So then the closed version, sorry, that's the closed version. So that sets it at the very beginning. We then want to go across 16. So we want to go um, one zero. And then we want to go zero zero one zero 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 zero. And then the same again. Um, so this would all just be zero. So just copy and paste from above it. And this is the trick with these type of questions is write a key and then just reuse the stuff that you've already done. So then now I know 16 is this, it should be a lot feet easier. So zero, zero, one, zero, 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 and then 16 again. So then zero, zero, one, zero, 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 zero. Then we're gonna go uh, the last movement. So we're gonna go to zero, 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 which is gonna be this top left um, corner up here. So it's going to be zero, 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 and then 16. So zero, zero, one, zero, 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 zero. Then we want to do the escape character, which is the one that was originally written in the 16 bit instruction, which is this one. So um, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, and then FF. So one, 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 one. And then because it said specifies the end of a repeated set of instructions, that's when the code is finished. So then that's what the last bit is. So then escape and then 1A, done and dusted. So 001, 1011 and then 0001, 1010, done. Cool. So hopefully that you've picked up some stuff there that's helped. Um, if you have any questions, pop them down in the comments. More than happy to try. I'm not perfect. Um, that was my attempt at doing that. It's a three hour exam, so there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So um, the trick with these is the more practice you do. I will try and do um, two more of these um, before the, the exam that's coming up for you guys. So please tune in. Um, give feedback, have questions, bring them to class, and then that way I can try and give you a hand. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Good luck.